Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we bring you day 261 of Russian invasion into Ukraine with Alexei Rostovich, advisor to the office of the president of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician. The main news for today would be the occupation of Kherson. However, almost 18 of 20,000 troops uh, managed to leave Kherson area across the river. Unfortunately, Ukrainian intel was not capable to track all their movements as they were pretty sporadic and sudden. Mark and Alexei also discussing the use and capabilities of new longer-reaching ammo for HIMARS. Some rumors in diplomatic circles about Iran that doesn't really want to give ballistic missiles to Russia. And clumsiness of Putin's regime, which actually faulted the capability of Russian troops to continue any defense of the Kherson region. And of course, G20 in Indonesia, President Zelensky is scheduled to attend online. New perspectives related to American elections, and congratulations to Poland with their day of independence. Enjoy. How do you like calls of Dugin to assassination of the king, of the Tsar? I think he already made statements like that, it's not the first time. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagan Live. It is Friday, November 11th. Time is 2 minutes past 10 in Kiev and 11 p.m. in Moscow. We're doing a regular stream, day 261, with Alexei Rostovich. Greetings, Alexei. Good evening. We have 120,000 joining us live. About 20,000 of you clicked the like button. Again, uh, thank you for spending this Friday for watching our streams here. In any case, please uh, post your links and uh, post links to that stream in your social media. It is a special day today. And of course, subscribe to Fagin Live. We're almost at 2 million subscribers, so if you haven't done that yet, uh, please do. And of course to Alexei Rostovich's channel and to the privateer station if you are listening or watching that in English. Let's start with the main news. It's uh, rather obvious, we'll be discussing it throughout the whole stream today. And let's probably bring the map up because after yesterday's stream when we talked that we don't need the map, I got a ton of hate uh, messages, so we do need the map. And percent relation of those who like map and those who don't like map, um, it's pretty substantial. So, yeah, it's a nice setup, Mark. I say we don't need a map and you get the hate. Yeah, I know, I know, I'll survive. So the map mostly is blue except for a few gray zones, right? Tell us about these gray zones, what does it mean? It means Ukraine troops have not entered that area yet. Why? because we just don't have enough to immediately cover everything. It's 120 by 60. That's a pretty big uh, area. But we'll get there. Just give us a little, little more time. So the main intrigue of everything was that they were going to stay in defense for at least a week over there. But what happened, and I guess historians will have to figure out the nuance of that, but I'm thinking two reasons. First is the collapse of Antonov Bridge, that famous explosion that was uh, on the interwebs everywhere. That's HIMARS hitting a column moving over the bridge and probably hitting the vehicle with a lot of shells, a lot of ammo on board. Or maybe another version if it hit and somehow detonated the explosives that we're going to use to blow the bridge up later. So what happened later? Kiselevka is that was the next one to fold right after. It's the first uh, settlement along the route M14 on the left from going from the northwest to Kherson. And they either did not get the message uh, to hold or they just panicked because of the bridge or something happened, but they really rapidly retreated from Kiselevka. And then, by the way, Chernobyevka, our 
miniseries are finally over. I think we had 34 episodes. We'll figure the details, but yeah, all those uh, fantastic hits of Russian equipment in Chernobyl are finally done. So, after the explosion and blow up of that uh, Antonov Bridge, right next to Kherson, a little bit uh, higher upstream, it also destroyed the pontoon bridge underneath it that they were going to use for infantry to walk. So most of the troops that were in the area, they managed to run, they fled through Novokakhovsk Dam on foot. That's uh, much higher up. Yes, here. So, understandably, they tried to evacuate a lot of equipment earlier, but uh, motorized infantry were supposed to hold the region, including some mobilized troops, including professionals who were supposed to stay in Kherson and hold the area. So all that runs overnight through that Novokakhovskaya Dam. Under our constant fire, we hit very well, at least four columns. So we'll see soon how many how much casualties did they suffer during that. And we were expecting a lot of trophies and a lot of prisoners uh, as a result of this operation. Um, not so many prisoners, there are actually just a few left who lost their way, and many of them dressed in civilian clothes, so we're figuring out. Uh, but as for equipment, we managed to get not super big stash, but a rather tasty number of grenade launchers, air defense systems, howitzers, armored vehicles, tanks. We'll calculate the numbers and let you know in a few days. So we managed to liberate the whole right bank in mere hours. That's the good news. The bad news is that we managed to just somewhat uh, bite them slightly on the way back. Didn't really uh, destroy any of their personnel uh, much. Uh, we, we hit some, but not too much. Uh, what we managed to capture, though, is we managed to capture enough equipment. So that precious equipment, uh, precious for Russian troops as well, we again got a pretty good stash of that. All right. Let's look at several questions that we have here about it. How many troops did they have on the right bank and how many of them fled? On Tuesday, they had at least 20,000 on that bank. Today is Friday and they managed to withdraw almost all 20,000. Yes, I think they managed to withdraw about 18,000. The rest are either running around in civilian clothes or have perished during the maneuver. So, besides the dam, by the way, they also used a ton of small boat, small craft on the river. And I think, I suspect, I strongly suspect at some point of this operation, Russian command completely lost control. And their troops just left their positions and ran for their lives in anything they could find, maybe found preliminary uh, earlier and stashed them somewhere or. They just ran because uh, local citizens have seen hundreds of small craft on the area between Novokakhovsk Dam and Tonov Bridge, so most infantry actually left using the small craft. So rem remember they were talking about uh, moving some of that uh, army, some of those troops to a different direction. We'll see how much of them are actually battle capable after such a retreat. Um, some of them will be all right, but uh, their condition and their morale, that's another question. And they will not have much of the equipment left. So Ukrainian intel, your field intel, should they've been tracking these moves? It's not a simple story. First of all, all that group fled overnight. All the communication towers were blown up, so there is no calm in the area. They also have martial law, law for 24 hours a day in that area. Basically, you're just not allowed to show up in the streets, otherwise you get shot. So they diminished the volume of information we were capable of collecting. We still were, but uh, not too much. And 
due to the weather you couldn't really use UAVs much. In the evening hours we still observed all of them on their positions. At night they packed and left. Didn't really pack much, just grab what they could. And for our troops to advance and to follow them on their heels would be much more difficult because you know, you can't really pursue your enemy along the road where they put some landmines and anti-tank mines on. So, yeah, we, we were careful pursuing them. Otherwise, yeah, if you do that with your eyes closed, you won't really reach anything. Why am I asking these questions is because there is a hypothesis being peddled around about some under-the-table agreement between Ukraine and Russia, or some people paint that Sullivan agreed, made, played a part in that agreement, as if Russians are retreating, Ukraine is not shelling them as they move. Others are saying it's a direct uh, agreement from my point of view. Don't, yeah, don't make that face, Alexei. From my point of view, I don't care how that happened, the territory was liberated and the rest what needs to be fought will be fought out. But since uh, there are some people actively peddling that, and there is some demand, some people are trying to believe that as well. I think there is a difference though between an agreement and the actual fighting, because uh, taking, if you say it's an agreement, you devalue the blood and lives of our troops who were lost in the process of kicking them out. Nobody agreed with anybody. Whom to agree to? Biden did make a statement that uh, America is not negotiating with Russians. Russia needs to negotiate with, United, with Ukraine, whatever Ukraine wants to. Everybody in G20 refused to negotiate with Putin on, about this war. Those uh, countries that could play some role. And Zelensky also made a statement that there is no reason for negotiation until there is a single Russian soldier on the Ukraine territory. And, and these positions were stated out loud. Yes, I understand, Alexei, but we need to go over them again because there is that theory being propagated and I'd rather address it than not. And I'm just hypothesizing what could have Ukraine got in if that aggression agreement existed. I can't grasp if Ukraine gets the territory, what would Moscow get? What could Ukraine give to Moscow? What Kiev? If that existed, what would even be the condition? There are no agreement conditions because there is no agreement. These are fairy tales. I've been listening to these fairy tales since the first hours of Kyiv operation. I'm talking that through. There is a analogy here with Kyiv, Sumy, Kharkov, Chernigov, all these operations uh, some people are claiming to be prearranged. We don't. I actually was on the field, let's place it delicately, um, in their retreat from under Kyiv, and I know that it was not anything contractual. They were hitting them, we were hitting them non-stop. Our aviation was landing, just getting new ammo and going back up in the air. They didn't even have time to run to the bathroom. So everything that could shoot was shooting. We didn't have much, that's why. And some people use that factor as a uh, their reasoning for any contractuality or whatever of these moves. We just don't have enough. Even yesterday, we were shelling them as they were retreating. And, you know, if we have eight brigades of uh, military, of Ukrainian military, attacking eight brigades of Russian Federation, we can't really encircle them. We're at about the same amount of troops. So, also, Overnight, they lost roughly about 2,000 troops and they lost a lot of equipment and we hit them at least four times, four columns that were crossing the dam. So that's not a good term for any agreement. All right, 360,000 are with us, about 100,000 click the like button, subscribe to our channel and post links to where you can. Uh, let's talk more about details. From Nova Kachovka and Kherson to the mouth of Crimea, it's less than 80 kilometers, it's about 60 miles.
That means that HIMARS can reach that. Yes, we discussed that. This is a very good news, Mark. This cannot not bring joy. Yep, see, we can reach Chaplinka, airfield where Russian troops are based. By the way, there are some videos of uh, some of the aircraft they left in the airfield when fleeing overnight, speaking of pre-arranged, pre right? So, I understand we also have now about eight brigades that we don't need to keep at the longer front, right? So, I'm thinking these eight brigades will go somewhere. And that's a good force in today's times. And remember, some people were saying after Kherson, there'll be a pause, there'll be some strategic lull. And my estimation, there will not be any pause. The front is crumpling, so why should we wait? And we actually do have capabilities. We uh, ended this operation, the Kherson area, the occupation with some profit and in better condition. So we got some trophies, we still have about the same number of troops, and they are a bit demoralized, disorganized, and without half at least of their equipment. So now if they'll be moving their troops, they'll be demoralized troops with lack of armor, and will be much happier troops with more armor and tools. So we'll see who brings more change to the front. Okay, yesterday there was a discussion about some HIMARS ammo. I got a message from one reader from the United States, I'm not going to say his name, but he said he attended the meeting of his senator in Norfolk in Virginia. He was meeting with the Ukrainian community there, and you know that Warner, uh, the senator, is the head of committee that aids Ukraine. He showed deep understanding of the whole situation and sympathy to Ukraine, answering questions to about about HIMARS. He actually repeated what Biden said that they are going to supply that they are supplying 160 mile radius missiles. Um, basically, repeating Biden's that they don't supply 300 mile radius, but they will supply 160. And he mentioned several times uh, that fact basically verbatim saying that I'm not a specialist, but we're not supplying 300 miles, we're only supplying 160 miles. Among other interesting facts, he mentioned that nobody will negotiate anything with Putin and made a big uh, emphasis on uh, needs to negotiate further with China. So this is a real man with email name, of course, Ukrainian last name, who lives there in the US. So does it mean that can we suppose that Ukraine finally is going to get these ammo, or maybe you already have them? Because there are some statements made by Biden and by some senators and other streams of data are trickling through. Until I see them on the battlefront, Mark, I cannot believe that. If to imagine that you do have them, how far can they reach? So the current ones, they can reach the mouth of Crimea. These ones will probably be able to reach Jankoy. See that airport at the bottom? Probably Gvardeyevsky and Saki. Um, see the three airports on the left, center and left. So those in Crimea will definitely be within reach. And they have a lot of, it's not just on Kherson that we're, we'll be looking at. There are a lot of interesting targets throughout the front line. If you look, for example, at the other part, from Kharkov to Orekhova, they reach on the whole length, on the whole depth of the occupied territory. They would actually have no place, nowhere to hide. Current Heimers reaching pretty far, but these new ones they will reach any corner. So HIMARS, they actually did change the flow of this war, right? They were one of the game-changing weapons in this war when Ukraine got HIMARS. But when, and if you get these uh, longer-range missiles, that might actually change the character. 
Yes, Mark. If uh, they give us enough shells, they will be able to change the situation. If they give us four, then no, it won't. But who gives you in four? What, what are we talking about? Oh, Mark, I'll, I'll tell you a story about how many missiles we got the first time when we got HIMARS. I'll tell you at the end of the war. You'll be surprised. But uh, it will be a game-changing weapon in general. There is another uh, piece of news that I'm not... I'm hesitant to share, but since we're just blabbering here and uh, quite irresponsible fellas... Um, Okay, I'll venture. Uh, Iran, according to some rumors, is not willing, is not giddy about giving its uh, ballistic missiles to Russia. Basically, somebody explained them the consequences of that step, and Iran is seriously considering the outcome if they do that. So they basically put that deal on pause, apparently, according to these rumors. So Patrushov travel to Iran and try to negotiate things there in vain. I suspect so. And if, if it is true, that would be just as good piece of news as uh, new HIMARS missiles. You know, I am looking at the map and thinking, if, I get this, if we get these missiles, there is one tasty target that we can shoot and everything will collapse on their side. I can't, but it's, it's so tempting. Okay, well, let our viewers practice their strategic tactical thinking and figure it out on their own. Yes, I know, I guess. I guess we have to. At least for now. By the way, Russian propaganda is stating their official stance is we withdrew for a little bit, everything will be tipped up and normal. Surovikin is a good general and will take some parts, some of our detachments from Kherson region and we'll move them to another part of the front. Okay, so you're saying they will be lacking some equipment, but for example, they'll reform them and, and rearrange them and send them where? To Svatova, to Bakhmut? At the same time, here is the Crimean mouth, right? Where do you send them? They're idiots, Mark. They're fighting a media political war. If we're diving into that rabbit hole, let me show you another interesting situation. Imagine yourself as a commander of Russian company or even a battalion that is left to, to defend the territory and left to be in are your guard to protect his fellows, fellow troops and basically cover his friends with uh, their own lives to allow for the rest to retreat. And he's sweating and expe expecting Ukrainian army to show up soon and probably level and kill everybody there in term in lieu of fighting. And then he looks to the side and sees his own troops leaving. He turns to them and wonders, where are you going, fellas? And they answer, well, General Command gave an order yesterday, did you see that on TV? They gave an order to retreat. And what can a commander do in this case? A company commander or battalion commander? He basically can retort saying, well, we are the ones tasked with defending the operation. He would get it back immediately, why us? There is a general command to retreat, so we can issue that. We're just following the commands. Nobody told that we are the ones protecting them. He didn't tell that. So he's in a very precarious situation in this case. And not a single commander of a brigade, company, battalion, or anyone, even a platoon commander, cannot explain why do they need to stay and die when the minister and the commander of that front announced complete retreat. If they had any thought in their head, they would have never made this statement public. They would have withdrawn first and then made a public statement. And they're fighting this war just like that. Their media goals are higher than political, and political goals are definitely higher than military goals. And those who believe in some conspiracy theories that there'll be some Venk's army coming and changing the situation on the front and defeating all Ukraine armies. That's not going to happen. People don't change over to overnight. 
just that decision, that statement on the on the screen, confirms that they still haven't changed that. They uh, the changes have not been made. So it just confirms that their view of reality is a bit irrational and it's also very non-professional and they suffer the consequences of these stupid decisions that they make. And when somebody believes that all of a sudden this army will regroup and attack us again somewhere, it's almost uh, as probable as the very weak and sick bird of a small caliber uh, decides to become a big eagle and big and healthy eagle. No, it can pretend it is, but it'll never be. Remember that book, Bad Advices by Grigory Oster? There are funny little poems for kids. I'll read one. Here. That's for people like that. An advice who think that they will change and change the flow of war. If you decided to swim and jumped into the water, but if you're falling in the water and decided that you don't want to, you just make a decision you don't want to and fly back up. Stop falling because every human can make a decision and change everything. So yeah, that's that's their advice for them. According to their logic, they'll probably throw them somewhere near Solidar, Bakhmut, because they at least tasked with uh, getting back Lugansk and Donetsk regions. We did all that and we went to Kiev and Kherson only because we wanted to capture the balance of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. And we tied the Ukraine army in the north and in the south and now that we achieved the goals we captured these two regions. So maybe they're hoping for that and that's something maybe they can sell to their public. But nobody will give it to them. That's one. There's a lot of surprises in store for them too. And a couple more slaps like that. I want to say how many of them we need, like, like Kharkov and Kherson operations. One, two, three, four, five. Five operations and not a single Russian soldier will remain in Ukraine. Five directions, right? It's not too complicated. Well, it's it's complex operations, but it will be done. And they don't have much to throw against it. And I think those last idiots in Russia who believed that this war has any perspective are gone after this Kherson withdrawal. I'll tell you more. Russian staples, the main staples that held that uh, picture for them was that army, Putin's regime and their idea of Russia. Army is gone. Putin is gone as well after a Kherson operation. Did you hear what they're talking about in, uh, in their talk shows about Putin? Dugin already asked for assassination of Tsar. His regime starts to shake. So his regime is still crumbling, but they still have the idea of a strong and angry Russia. And you know when this idea will disappear? When we'll see that it's falling? When we'll see them discussing on their talk shows future, different outcomes, different future. The moment they start uh, seeing different options for them in the future is when their, their stapled Putin's Russia is gone because the family cannot exist when they are discussing, when there are two different kinds of future they root for. They are not too far away from that. And after Kherson operation, Putin's Russia is definitely broken. There are some dreamers who still think that they'll somehow find a new flow in this war and find their victory. But that's about nothing, Mark. That's too far detached from reality. You know, they actually started digging trenches near Crimea mouth. Oh yeah, they are. We have that data. They understand where the next barrage will fall and where we'll advance next. So, frankly, I'm thinking they need to move their troops to the mouth of Crimea, not, not to Bakhmut. 
If you were a logical creature, Mark, yes, you would want to do that. But they're not acting logically. I'm just saying military, Ukraine military can move that way. They do not want maybe to deoccupy the entirety of the left bank and just straight go for Crimea. That's what I'm saying. Not too many people understand the operative theater in that area. Okay, if we're going that way, let me tell you more. Militopol in Zaporozhye region is very different from Kherson region. They have much fewer irrigation systems and it's a wide and free step over there where you can move even without any roads. And these people do understand that. And that's why they are making fortifications in the north of Crimea because everything may happen much faster than they think. This is not Kherson region, where you need to fight and crawl from one channel to another channel, because there are concrete fortified elements. Over there, Makhno, back in the First World War times, uh, Russian Civil War times, was riding his tachankas with machine guns. So we'll see. We'll see, right. 450,000 are watching us over... 150,000 click the like button. Please again subscribe if you haven't done that to Fagin Live and to Alexei Rostovich in the description to that video. Let's go back to G20 summit. There are some new pieces of information about them. Putin will not visit it, he will not even be there in the online mode. It's only his uh, minister, Lavrov, who is going there, and Biden already made a statement he's not going to meet with him. Zelensky is scheduled to be present online, to make a statement online. Do you prognosticate that China, who is going to meet with Biden, they will be discussing several items, and then I think it's pretty sure to expect that they will be talking about Ukraine, Taiwan. Do you think they may reach some mutual agreement about joint position regarding the war in Eastern Europe? They can agree, they can come to maybe three terms. So they can discuss and set new framework and their positions about Russian aggression in Ukraine. Second, they fail to agree on anything, and there is a period of somewhat cold war. And third is when they don't agree on some things, agree on others, and whatever happens continues. Third version is not exactly tasty for many people because there's a lot of muddy water around that. Second option with the Cold War is pretty bad because China in this case will eventually start helping Russia. We will win because the West will also amp up their help, but it'll be it'll lead to much higher costs for us in the West. But if they reach any agreement, then this contract will be against Russia. It's pretty clear cut in this case. So, in some sense, it is uh, favorable for us if they come to, to an agreement, but it's hard to predict where and how they will end that conversation. Do you think they may agree to some sanctions from China in regards to Moscow? I don't think so. China needs some success from Moscow to play that as a success in their general standing against the West. And they would have been, uh, they would expect, they would appreciate if the West would be somewhat humiliated in Ukraine. And that didn't quite work for them. It is not as bad now to start supporting Moscow with that weapons, but it also is not in the place where they would start slapping sanctions against Moscow. They don't, there is no game for them in that. 
They are reacting to the Western sanctions, yes, because they don't want to face secondary sanctions and they're limiting some supply items. And it's uh, still Russian oil and Russian supplies to China is somewhat questionable because they'll, if they will be purchasing Russian energy, they will be facing some of the secondary sanctions. So it'll be interesting how they manage that. But uh, they did make a statement about non-using of nukes. So that was good. And we'll see what they come to agree about. It is difficult to say at this point. But that's a good thing that Americans are not going to meet a Russian representative before they talk to China. They basically do not, they're not interested in discussing Russian opinion before uh, talks with China. It's between these two countries. Okay, what about coming winter? It's November, almost middle of November. Do you see any weather complications for what will be unfolding on the front? Will they intensify? Will they aid some fighting? Will they not? Let's discuss that because there is a lot of different communication about that, different speculations. And Mark, need to consider, winter doesn't really affect our fighting. In eight years of our conflict on Donbass, the most active ones were probably in winter. The only factor that affects our capability to fight and our enemy's capability to fight is rains. Rains when everything turns into slush and the equipment cannot work. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. It's pretty cold in the trench though, Alexei. Mark, I'll tell you, the only winter when I did not freeze, or several winters, is when I was on the front line. Because in the field, you really dress up. Because in a, in a city, you basically, hey, I'll just run to the car and drive, so you don't care much. Over there, you have thermal underlayer, you have uh, outerwear, you have some special things on your, sh on your legs. It's minus 20 outside, but you are in a small field encampment and you're warm. You're warm, there is a small uh, fireplace, a small stove maybe. And even if you have to run a little bit in all that, you become so hot you even want to take some of their clothes off. So, so you prognosticate that winter will not really affect. By the way, Hodges did guess Kherson pretty well in his statement. Yeah, he did. Uh, Millie didn't. Correct, yes, Millie didn't. So, do you think in this winter these five operations have a chance for success that you mentioned? Mark, I don't know, everything is happening so fast that I'm starting to believe that things may happen much faster than we expected them to. You're a specialist uh, in Russia much better than I am. When you were telling me that Russia is very unpredictable, Sometimes, yeah, maybe a week from now we could be sitting in Sevastopol and having coffee. I mean, theoretically it's possible. Here's the thing though, here's the factor. So, in America they had elections. What do you think, the new, new Congress comes into power on the 3rd of January. What will happen until then? There'll be a very tight work of American elites to figure out new strategy about all things. Chinese deals, Iranian question. Formally, they'll be dividing committees and representations there. The second thing, there'll be a lot of motion between these committees, between uh, them and deep state fellows. But we can carefully predict that Democrats and Republicans, the ones that are centrist, they're not too much in opposition on the Ukraine question to each other. Republicans, though, do have a problem with isolationists on uh, their flag, and uh, Dems have a problem with the leftists. So the central core of these parties, they actually started to see allies in each other, because uh, some of them are looking at the very right and the very left specter with horror, and they're seeing that their pals across the aisle are much better group than the extremes ones. And also, there was no apparent red wave as it was expected. So there is only two voices in the Senate, I think, that uh, changed hands, and maybe 18 in the 
in Congress. So many observers even called that uh, Trump's loss. So Republican Party is starting to look at the other candidate and sponsors are looking at the other candidate and the funding starting to redirect streams of funding to the other candidate. You're meaning DeSantis, Florida governor. Yes. So I have a suspicion that central leaning members of both parties may find common like common ground and common language. And on January 3rd or January 4th, we may wake up in a new world when America will be setting some new rules. And I'm thinking, I'm almost 100% positive that military help to Ukraine will increase. Financial help may decrease because that's the position of the Republican electorate who doesn't really want to help Ukraine uh, as it is a corrupt failed state, those fairy tales that are being peddled. But at the same time, Republicans are often that hawkish part of their polit political system and they don't really want Ukraine to lose because then they, they're losing big geopolitical picture and China becomes much stronger. Apparently, ooh, China may realize that some of the Western interests can be defeated militarily. So, so yeah, there'll be support. But what would you also do if you were leadership of Ukraine? And you understood that in a month and a half situation might be very different. You would be very intensively fighting for the territories that you have, because January 3rd may bring a change. I don't think that's the potentiality for us, but I expect that our, again, this is my point of view, I'm not saying it as advisor to the office right now, but I think there will not be a pause, that our military forces will intensify their operations in the month and a half. We have tools, we have new aid brigades available, we have time, we have desire, we have targets, then what's to wait for? All right, all right, 468,000 joined us on Friday night, over 140, 150,000 click the like button. Thank you, dear friends, for spending this time with us. We have a stream tomorrow, Alexei? Possibly, yes. Uh, Sunday will be not. Uh, yes, Sunday is a family day, right? We don't do streams on Sunday. And please share links to that stream and subscribe to Fagin Live and to Alexei Aristovich. See you tomorrow then. We'll talk about everything else we did not cover today. Today is a special day, it's a holiday with Kherson. By the way, it's also a day of independence in Poland. I want to congratulate all Poles who are watching us. They really saved us in this situation with political, military support, refugee support. They've been the best sister of Ukraine. We are very grateful. We'll never forget that. Thank you very much. Happy holiday. And see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Всем пока. Всем пока. Спасибо. Да, спасибо.